I'm a holistic person. And uh, he said, uh, uh, the, the physical tests were, were okay. Uh, some were a little low, but she said not to worry about it. And uh, then uh, she uh, described something for where, as she, I, I hope I'm putting it in the right word, where I have glitches and it's like I stop for a minute and then it takes a while for me to get. So she's, I got, said, well, let's try this. And it's a, a homeopathic type of medicine. And so was, I'm just thanking God that it wasn't anything else more than that. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Hey, Lori, would you share the good report about Jenny Havens with everyone? I'm not sure if everyone knows uh, about Jenny. Well, and I know you were the last one to see her uh, yeah. today, but it was we enjoyed uh, visiting uh, yesterday because, um, you know, I just didn't know what to expect, you, you know, the nature of the surgery. And Jenny looked very good. Uh, even Tony commented on her coloring. It was yeah. odd. But, um, and she was, you know, just, you know, very pleasant. And uh, oh, it's always nice to see Joy. And they were, get, you know, getting their ducks in order for the rehab. And then after the rehab, the, um, the place where Jenny will be living in assisted, assisted living. Um, and Jenny okay. was excited. Um, and, I, and she just seemed to be doing very, very well. Um, you know, I know health is a daily thing, I, you know, and none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. But um, she, it was a very pleasant visit. And, um, you know, Joy, um, you know, we just tried to reassure Joy that, you know, we were there and, you know, because there's a lot of, of uh, pressure on Joy with her dad and then her sister and her job and everything else. But then, to, to, you know, knowing that Stu went was just the ice, you know, which is perfect because I, I'm sure that that just made her feel just wonderfully cared for. So the shepherd was in the building. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Well, she wanted me to relate to all of you. She's feeling fine. And I asked her, I said, would you like to say anything to all the people tonight on the Zoom? She said, just tell them I'm feeling fine. Aww. She is really excited about having her own place here at Mansfield. <laughs> and, I, and I said, about how long are you going to be in rehab? I think she's, she may be in rehab at the Copper Trace where Dave Blind was, which is that's out there. That's what they're hoping for. Oh, that's what they're hoping okay, for, yeah. Okay. And so, yeah, she's... Uh, she said probably two weeks, and then uh, she will be in assisted living at, uh, is it Crown Point? That's what they're hoping for, and, and yeah. things look good. Yeah, and she'll have her own awesome. place, assisted living. And I know when my dad went into assisted living, he, he loved it. He had his own apartment, you know. He didn't have anybody really looking over his shoulder telling him what to do. And, uh, <laughs> He did have nurses checking up on him, but uh, he he really liked it. So uh, I think she is looking forward to having her own uh, her own space there. That'll be that'll be nice. Amen. So we want to keep we'll we'll pray for them too at the end of the service that, that God continues just to bring uh, order and resolve there in that whole situation. And because I know Joy does want to get back to work and. To get get everything uh, finished that needs to be, be finished so she can to blend my voice with Thank her. you. That was and, fun. To hear that sweet voice, I'm telling you, I got totally blessed. And yeah. I think God did too. So thank you, Deborah, for being there for us. Thank you. You're welcome. I praise God I was able to to remember the chords to, to most of those. So that was great. Well, you're doing better than the rest of us musicians. <laughs> <laughs> we forget the chords and sometimes the words, you know, so 
<laughs> but I think God, he overlooks that. He looks at our heart, you know, and that's the important thing. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Just want to welcome Ray on our uh, Zoom. First time hey. we're here tonight. Hey. Yeah. 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 One day. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> I had I had trouble getting here, but I'm glad that I got to get with you guys. I'm so happy that we're all together. <laughs> yes, welcome to Wednesday Zoom. <laughs> yeah, we're here. Oh yeah, she said Zoom with an M, not Zoom. 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 We're all one big happy family. Yeah. Boy. Yeah, you're funny. Laugh. Yeah. 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 You're funny, Lori. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, she is funny. <laughs> well, I guess ah. no one else has a testimony. It's not it? true. You have a testimony? No, I'm okay. Oh, you're right. Okay. The topic tonight would be things that affect spiritual growth, both Hi, positive and or negative. You know, you can. Do one or the other, or a little of both. So, who would like to start us off tonight? Spiritual things that affect spiritual growth. I can start. Yeah, go ahead, Lori. Um, when I started looking over the the sheets and the topic, it was just a huge topic, just, you know, incredible. And um, I thought about, I, I kind of honed in on, um, you know, on the broad picture of the sheets and um, uh, the scripture uh, growing in, in, uh, in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it was interesting um, uh, because I thought about first, okay, first Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, and that speaks about envy and strife and divisions that are carnal, not mature, but carnal. And that, um, you know, we all plant and water, but only God gives the increase. And the planters and the waterers are one. So to grow, Ferris had given us the little outline. We need to eat. We need to pray. We need to practice and learn spiritual hygiene. And I thought that was a, an interesting one. And I wanted to add... Um, Excuse me. Papers. I wanted to add um, to the to um, to First John one nine. Ferris had that down. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Which is a, a you know, if you once you really believe that. And, and you receive it into your spirit. It, it, there's a lot of deliverance in that, um, and you know. And I, I would add to that Second Corinthians seven one, because in Second Corinthians um, seven one, he t they it, it was all it, it it surprised me when I first read it. Um, having therefore these promises, uh, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Which, you know, I had thought maybe the spirit was not, you know, that the spirit belongs to God, that it wasn't subject to, um, you know, to, to anything carnal. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And I think, um, you know, that's what we're seeing in today's world, that there is not much holiness and not a fear of God. Everyone is doing their own thing. They're serving themselves and, you know, doing what they, what they want to do. So um, then 
So then the other corn were planted and we grow in, in, in a spiritual family. And I thought about the garden. Um, it, you know, Ferris, uh, like in heaven, wants to a garden. And I think that, you know, we can liken our church family to a garden. I mean, we're all flowers. Um, obviously, you know, nobody wants to be a weed. So, um, uh, yeah. he gave the scripture, and I'll always remember the form for fellowship phrase that um, I've never been able to forget, but we were formed for fellowship. So we need regular spiritual exercise, we need spiritual protection, and we need to give out. So uh, it, it's important for us to empty in order to be filled with living water. And we, you know, Ferris has brought wonderful teachings about living water. Um, then, of course, the Second Peter one four through ten verse is so, um, you know, it's just a good verse, you know, for to to kind of tie everything um, that we add to our faith virtue, then knowledge, then temperance, then patience, then then godliness. And after all that, it's interesting that we're able to add brotherly kindness and charity. After all those things, the brotherly kind comes the brotherly kindness and charity. Um, so, you know, we thought, of course, about being fruitful trees. And I know you've heard the expression, you know, fruit trees don't eat their own fruit. So, you know, it, it's for other people. So, um, the other sheet that really caught my eye was the kind of older, it looked like an older sheet. And Ferris, um, uh, the introduction was, was really um, interesting and thought-provoking. He said, are we attempting to grow in grace and knowledge, as Peter exhorts, or are we just multiplying the babes? I think it's a prerogative on the part of those of us who minister to, to quit treating people like orphans and start causing God's children to mature. So, um, I thought about that statement, and Stu was so gracious to, um, we, we kind of discussed it through texts, because I'm thinking, well, what does it mean to treat people like orphans? So, um, here's, you know, where I went on so many rabbit trails, um, you know, looking at so many scriptures. And I think that um, that what I, I I came at the crux of that was um, are we growing or just getting fat? Now <laughs> I always have to laugh because um, when I think of that word fat, I always think of the scripture that my dad and I shared: "The liberal soul shall be made fat," and and the in the context of that, um, I looked up, you know, the, the um, definition of liberal, and it means gracious and generous. But now, you know, it seems to have a, you know, it's hurled as kind of a bad connotation. Um, because Daddy and I were kind of on opposite ends of the political spectrum, but we always had that, the liberal soul shall be made fat. So it was... When he, um, on, on the, sh the sheet that I looked at, when he was talking about, don't pray for gifts and power, but first let's learn to love. And obviously, I think we have all seen the effects. Um, well, I mean, there's zeal without knowledge, and there's, you know, the pride of the gifts without cultivating the fruit of love. And, and, you know, it's something that takes a while. I mean, it doesn't just, um, you know, doesn't come immediately. Then we've got these, um, all these extremes uh, versus moderation. So I thought about when Stu said we, we, we grow up as calves of the stall. 
We are fed and we're protected. We're not trying to get our own food and we're protected. And I thought too about the chicks under the mother wing that Jesus took them, told to Israel. That That's such a beautiful, um, I love thinking, you know, imagining that. So, um, I, uh, let's see. Okay, so I thought that the idea of quit treating people like orphans would be to appointing them to their true father um, who has his plans and purposes for them. And Stu uh, originally sent Psalm 68.5 and uh, um, we can just go there, Psalm 68.5. which is um, that, that he's describing God, a father of the fatherless, and a judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. And of course, the second verse, God said of the solitary in families, is, I mean, that's been such a comfort for all the single people in the church, that he sets the solitary in families. I, just, I feel very strongly about the family of God. Um, and James uh, 127 talks about pure, undefiled religion is to visit the fatherless. So um, then I, I looked at um, John 14, 18, and that, um, that says... Uh, I should have already had this. John 14, 8, 18 says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. But in the NIV, um, John 14, 18 says, I will not leave you as orphans. And I, I looked um, I, I looked in different translations, and most of them did use the word orphan. So, um, okay, and I, and I wanted to say, um, I mean, not me along with everyone, every mother here I know has wonderful memories of your kids when they were babies, when they had, you know, when they were wearing diapers, they had, you know, sweet little baby legs, and we know that it's so inappropriate to think of an adult you know, as a baby, you know, sucking the pacifier and wearing a diaper. I mean, there's just something wrong with with that with that image. And I um, I think that one of the keys to growing spiritually is First um, Corinthians sixteen thirteen. You know, there's so you know so much confirmation and, and reconfirmation about how to grow spiritually. But in 1613, it says, Watch ye stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. And, you know, there are some things that we have, that we give into um, that, that are scriptural. We forgive. We, you know, are told to turn the other cheek. Um, you know, um, those are things that, that, you know, we kind of give into. Well, we give ground, and with personal offense and forgiveness. And the, um, the, the truth of the scripture is to stand firm in the faith of Jesus Christ. So, um, I, then I just have a few things on spiritual hindrances. I do think that biblical illiteracy is, is a big deal um, because the Bible teaches us about ourselves. I hadn't really thought about that until um, a few months ago, that as we read, of course, we learn about a lot of things, but it also teaches us about ourselves. And, of course, the Word is living. I mean, it's the only book that's alive. 
And I think that uh, stubbornness and pride will keep will be a hindrance to growth. But I wanted to um, to to mention not enough nutrients. And in Luke 13, 6 through 9, Jesus um, talked, it was a fig tree. Let me just turn to Luke 13. And from that, we get the idea that he does expect maturity. Mm -hmm. um, all right, Luke 13, um, 6 through 9. Um, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And the, um, the, uh, the dresser of the vineyard said to him, he answering, said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about and dung it. And if it and if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. So it's in the digging about and the dung and, and the dunging. I mean, obviously, you know, we have to give those nutrients and a lot of times we have to cut away things that are already there. So um, it's uh, the the growth is not automatic, um, but it's it's um, there's that word intentional, <laughs> and then um, growth comes from God as we cooperate with the Holy Spirit. So our faith should be progressive, um, and Hebrews five twelve through fourteen. Um, is a good a good way to describe that. Oh, gosh. Hebrews five, twelve through fourteen. Um, for when for the time he ought to be teachers. He had need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong drink. So, uh, you know, he's saying that, I'll skip 13, but uh, he said, Strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses, their spiritual senses, exercise to discern both good and evil. So, um, I think, you know, the main thing is to, to not to, to resist the Holy Spirit. That if you're going to be teachable and you want the Holy Spirit to, you know, to really teach you, then, you know, the ball's in your court. Um, and I, I thought about another, just another point okay, we don't want to just have a bunch of fat babies. How do we we treat, um, you know, how do we help babies to grow? So we're kind of caught sometimes, even in the natural, between smother love versus tough love versus truth. You know, I mean, there we are. How is it that we can get, you know, the babes to grow? And again, it's a comfort to know that the Holy Spirit has that well under control and that God, you know, God knows what he's doing. Yeah. And I think we just have to get, you know, under submission and be able to hear from God. Anyway, there was just so, so much, um, so much to, on um, these sheets. But I did love the fact that, you know, Ferris said, um, <laughs> Are we just multiplying the babes? You know, that, boy, that's a point to ponder. You, you know, because um, you, you sure don't want to start a babe off in one direction and then have them fall because then it's even worse for the babe. I mean, that's a huge responsibility. So I just, um, you know, I, I'm just so grateful for all of Ferris's um, 
his his teachings and, and you know the groundwork as an apostle that he laid. But I don't know. Um, <laughs> Oh, it, it, there's a lot to consider in all these worksheets. Yes. That's all I have. Well, thank you, Lorraine. Very good. Amen. Very good. Some time back, I looked up the phrase strong meat. And the word strong, if you look it up in the original language there in the Greek, is stereos. Like stereophonic music. And some of you that are my age or older, We'll remember when stereophonic music came in. Before that, all we had was monophonic. And so stereophonic music was solid. It was strong. You know? And so that word uh, strong, stereos, and meat is trophé, which actually is also translated as food. Uh, so it's solid food, stereos, solid, trophy food, and it, it requires more powerful digestive organs uh, than are possessed by a babe. So a fuller knowledge of Christ uh, is, is necessary, you know, so we want to bring people up. We don't want, we don't want to choke people. I think the thing is, too, uh, people can, you know, if they can't quite chew it at the time, they need to, you know, put it aside for a later time if they're not quite ready for that. Because I know in almost every one of our services, there's going to be a whole variety of uh, milk, uh, bread, meat, and strong meat. Mm -hmm. you know, there's probably going to be a whole cornucopia of different types of nourishment. And so, uh, as, you know, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And so, very good, Lori. Who'd like to go next? Oh, I will. Yeah, go ahead, Nancy. Um, well, first of all, I want I wanted to say that just it was so interesting to me. Um, I don't read many um, outside spiritual books. I I don't do that much because I just don't want to be confused. <laughs> but one thing that I do do, I have a. Oswald Chambers uh, book, and I read that every morning because there's so much in there that he is just teachings for a young man uh, were so similar to Ferris, and I thought it was so interesting today. Uh, today's reading was um, the whole thing pointed toward we are not, it is not our duty to save souls. That is the Lord's, he draws. Now, of course, we do our part to speak the word and so on. But our duty is to discipline those souls after they've been saved. And there's always someone behind us. First, I should say there's always someone ahead of us that we can learn from and that we need to be paying attention to and listening and pattering, patterning our lives after and so on. You know, like Paul said, uh, the Apostle Paul said, be ye followers of me, even as I am of Christ. And that word there is, I think we've been taught that that's mimic verse, mimic verse. And so we're, what we see in those ahead of us on the spiritual ladder, and we're all, you know, we're all you know, but I, I think you're getting the idea. Uh, there's always someone that we can look to and pattern ourselves after. But then there are also those that we know um, are ones that we can disciple if they'll work, if they'll, if they will listen to us. And I think we have, to, you know, the Lord charges us with that, and we have to be very careful about how we do that. And so it was interesting to me 
that even, uh, you know, Oswald Chambers has been gone for many, many years and he died as a young man, but it's the same spirit, you know, and, and that was kind of a preface uh, to my study today, and so I was, I was thankful for that. And then I also thought about um, when we go into a restaurant and sit down and look at a menu, um, it's, you know, we, we, we order different things. And sometimes when we go to the same restaurant over and over and we know that something's good, we might order that again and it might have a little bit of a twist to it. But it's boring. It's boring <laughs> to just have milk all the time or just have meat all the time or salad or dessert or whatever you, you know, whatever you might order. And so we have to have a well-balanced meat, uh, meal. And I thought about the Lord, um, you know, bringing us to his banqueting table. And when I think of the word banquet, I don't think just one food. <laughs> you know, what a banquet is many varieties, many different things. And that's all part of the milk and bread and meat and strong meat. And so those were just some of the preliminary thoughts I, I had. But after I um, after I heard Paul's message on Sunday, our Paul's message on Sunday, I, I went out of there and I thought, what are the things that I personally am doing or um, am directly involved in that are hindering me? that can hinder my spiritual growth. And the first scripture that came to my mind was Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. And of course, that's very familiar to all of us. But I'm going to read it again. The word never gets old. He, again, Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a thought of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does, does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sit, set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And... Um, and, you know, we all we know that when we see the word wherefore or therefore, we have to see what it's there for. <laughs> and so I look back in, in chapter 1 of Hebrews, and that is many times referred to as the great faith hall of fame. And um, the writer of Hebrews is really what he's doing is he's giving the resumes of many uh, great heroes in the faith that went on before us as examples so that as we look at them and how they overcome, uh, overcame obstacles and so on, it gives us hope that um, we can do the same. And that's that great, so because we are surrounded by that great cloud of witnesses that have gone on before us, not only in the scriptures, in this Heroes of Faith chapter, but also in thinking of those that we know ourselves that have gone on before us. And I, you know, I think, of course, I think we probably all think of Ferris maybe first, but, you know, I also think of others that have gone on. Um, I, my mother, um, um, you know, um, I, I think about <laughs> Audrey. I think about Marge Witt. I think about just many people that have gone on before us and think of the attributes in their lives that helped me. And Joyce Hoffman, you know, just the list it just goes on. And um, so that's that's because of that great cloud of witnesses. Because of that, we know that we have the hope that we can go on and finish the race too. And so I checked out a few of the words in, in Hebrews 1 and 2 there that helped me, and I know, you know, we we hear these over and over, but I thought, you know, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, every time 
I personally read, I see something new, and, and you know, so I, it's, it's sort of repetitive, and that's how we learn. That's how we become disciples, is repetition. And so in looking at, at what at Hebrews 1 and uh, 12, 1 and 2, um, the word lay, as, the words lay aside there, meaning to cast off or put away. We have to do it. It's not going to be done for us. It's, it's, you know, it's a direct action that we have to do ourselves. And then a weight there is a mass or a bulging load or a burden that causes one to bend due to the size or weight of the load. And um, I, I enjoy, um, probably way too much, <laughs> I enjoy watching uh, HGTV on, on television because I, I just enjoy the renovation and seeing some of these old homes, you know, what they can become. And uh, often in, in, the, in the shows, they use the term load-bearing wall. And they have to be very careful about removing some of those walls because um, if it is a load-bearing wall, it's the stress, that it, especially on the first story of a home, the stress of the second story on that home is resting on that load-bearing wall. And if it's removed, <laughs> it can be very, very dangerous. So... I thought about the loads that we carry. <laughs> uh, you know, really what we need to do is roll them over on Jesus. And he, because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And so if we can do that and have a balance, um, we don't have to worry about those weights that are that will bear, you know, uh, completely bear us down to the point that we can't handle them ourselves. And so, um, you know, that's what I thought about, that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And then as I looked at the word sin there, that is um, missing the mark. We all have been taught that, but it goes on. If you look at, if you search a little deeper, it's uh, missing the mark in such a way that you will not share in the ultimate prize. And I thought it was so interesting there not share. It's not that you will you will obtain the ultimate prize yourself, but you'll share in the, with those that have gone before you and those that are coming up behind you. And so that that was really interesting to me. And then in looking at the words easily beset, um, that means to more T H W A R T or try to stop a runner from every direction, every direction. And that's what the enemy, you know, tries to do. And it, and um, it, those, those uh, things that come against us that try to stop us, they can actually cause us to lay down prostrate. They can bear upon us so much that they can cause us to lay down instead of standing up upright and being ready for whatever the enemy uh, come, comes against us with. And then if you go on, um, to run there is to walk hastily or to run on a course that is set before you. My course is not the same as yours. It's what the Lord has set before me that I have to overcome. And then, you know, the purpose of, of that is, of course, to try to help others who might um, encounter the same problem. But it's my, and you know, one of my favorite things, is, is, is Pat, Pat will tell you this, because I just, we talked the other day. One of my favorite thoughts is, just think about this, and I may have asked this before, but just name me one person, just one person, that you would rather have their trials than your own. I can I can't name one person, not one. Because the Lord wants us to each have, yeah. to have to work out our own salvation with fear and trouble. And 
And so it's, you know, uh, these, these things are set up for us alone. And, um, you know, uh, they're patterned for us to learn ourselves. And so we have to run that race, that course that is set before me. Not your race, but my race and, and the one. And then, of course, the word patience there, uh, and I'm still in verse 1 here, but in um, it, it, the word patience there, we've heard this a hundred thousand times probably. Hupo mone is the ability to endure without learning joyfully. If you look a little deeper in the Greek, it's not only the ability to endure without murmuring, but to do that joyfully. And then um, um, a, a race is a place of assembly. I thought that was interesting because, you know, we're all in this together. And it's easier when we come together and have those trials and so on, pray for each other, encourage each other, sing together. You know, uh, it's, it's a place of assembly. This race is not... Uh, even though we're running our own race, it is not a solitary thing. There are others right along there with us. And um, then the, the words before us there uh, mean it's a view. It's, it's a view of something that is laid out before us. It is a, a, a path or a course or a um, think of the horizon. You know, when you look out, you see the the, the outstretched horizon. That's what is before us. The race that, that is before us is what we can see with our own mind's eye, uh, the course that we should travel ourselves. And whenever I read this first one, this is a carnal, but it's a, it's a visual. I like to put a, a word picture in my mind sometimes. And when I think about this verse, I think about the movie Force Dump. And you remember the scene where I think he was running out of the football stadium and the weights on his legs just seemed to miraculously drop off the faster he ran. And he, he they just, those braces just flew off his legs. And that's, I think that's the way the Lord wants us to uh, get rid of these things that try to hold us back. He just wants them. And, and Force never stopped running. I mean, you know, he just, as those weights came off, he, 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 he increased in speed, he increased in the length of his stride, and he never stopped. And I think that's what the Lord wants us to do spiritually. So that's a vision that I have in my mind. And now I enter verse 2. Um, um, I, I looked up the word looking there. And that is to consider attentively, to perceive or clearly discern, either physically or mentally. So looking unto the author, and that's the chief captain or prince or leader, and the finisher, that is one who completes or consummates fully a task that he was set to do accomplishes a fully. And then our faith there is a firm persuasion or moral conviction which results in a total reliance upon Jesus Christ for salvation. And then, you know, with joy again, and that, that joy is calm delight, great, great gladness and cheerfulness. So, in looking at that verse 2, we, 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 have this example in Jesus before us, our chief captain, the chief captain, he, he came with a task, he was able to accomplish it, and because of that, he, uh, he, and because of the joy that was set before him, I think I mentioned that even last week, um, we too can, we can, we too can receive that same reward to be, um, set down by the hand of our Father, and that's confirmed that's confirmed in Revelation 3.21. Jesus said, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and have sat down with my father in his throne. And so that, you know, without those weights and the sins and so on, we have the hope 
in, in, in the example of Jesus that we can we can do that. And so in thinking about all of this, um, what can hinder me are sins and weights, and I want to get rid of those. And then in going on um, in in studying the and like Lori said, oh my goodness, there was so much in these pages, just so much you could take, you could take just one line and build a whole sermon on it, and, and there was so much there. But uh, one thing uh, I picked out was um, uh, Hebrews 5.14, which um, where verse says there, um, you know, the strong meat belongs to them that are of holy age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And I thought about where do I need a spiritual overhaul? You know what? And, and, and it was just, you know, you, I learned you ask the Lord a question and he'll give you an answer. And sometimes you don't want to hear it. <laughs> but anyway, so in order for me, personally to possess and fully enjoy strong meat. And and I thought about this. Um, <laughs> I'll just read what I put down here. Enjoying strong meat is like in the natural a beautiful one inch thick, tender, medium rare, ribeye steak grilled to perfection by Chef Antonio Streety. I have enjoyed <laughs> them several times in the last, well, since Tony Memorial did that. He, now, I'm sure some of the rest of you know exactly how to prepare a steak, too, but Tony's got it down, and they're always good, and to me, that is strong meat, and I thought about that um, in, 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 you know, preparing, thinking about strong meat, I have to exercise, and in that scripture, that means to practice absolutely spiritually naked. I, I'm so surprised to see this. I have to practice spiritually naked with all of my organs, my eyes, my ears, my tongue, and um, uh, then the word use there is to form habits by practice. So when I exercise by reason of use, then I have to form good habits. And it takes a spiritual effort to discern between good and evil and then go on and turn righteous, uh, to righteousness for, for first five years ago that good and evil are opposite sides of the coin, but they're... <laughs> There, there, one is just not good or, I mean, righteousness is what we want to strive for. Not good or evil, but we want to strive on the one righteousness. So then I, you know, I said, we asked the Lord to get an answer. Well, I thought about this and this just happened to me very, very recently um, in discerning a good and evil. And in item three under the strong beat to Harris's uh, teaching there, uh, in item three, um, D, letter D, number four, he asks the question, is it good or evil to gossip about others when they aren't present? And when I read that question, you know how he used to say, oh me? <laughs> That's what I said. Oh, because I was very recently in a setting, and I have to confess I was, the word E B I L. I was evil. Now, I did not participate verbally in the conversation about another believer, but I listened and I laughed at the expense of a fellow believer. And I came away from that situation. I just felt so convicted and so dirty and so vexed. And I have purposed in my mind, Lord, help me with your grace. I will never allow that to happen again. I 
learned a very hard lesson. And it, I, you know, again, I asked the Lord, and He showed me First Timothy three eight very plainly says, "Likewise, must deacons be grave, not double tongued." And that word "double tongue" there implies improper speech. And I think it's not only speaking, but it's in our thought life, too. And then he also reminded me of Galatians 5.15, where it says, But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. And so it, it bears this definition there of gossip. really struck me. It said, says, when they aren't present. So, if you want to know if you're gossiping, this is the lesson I learned. Would you say, or would I say, the same things if the person were sitting right beside me? That is a real test of whether, and I thought that was so wise of him to bring that out. And I'm not, I'm not sure that I fully understand all of what gossip is. I know what it's not. I know what it's not. And in Proverbs 25, um, it says, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. So that's not gossip. That's for sure not gossip. And then in Romans 14, 19, it says, Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things for with one may, we may edify, build up one another. And then in Ephesians 4, 20, it says, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it might minister grace unto the hearers. And so uh, this particular thing right here, even though there was all of those pages and all those different things, this is what I need to, needed to learn from this particular teaching. And it taught me that I need to do away with the spoon, the Gerber baby food spoon. That, in that area, I just need to put that away. And I need to get, you know, pick up the fork and a sharp knife and start eating the strong meat in that kind of situation. And I, I pray that the next time, if that ever happens again, the Lord will show me mercy, and I will do one of two things. I thought about this. I thought I'll do one of two things. Either get up and just walk off, or say, you know what, let's just dial that person up, put them on speaker, and then let's go ahead and continue our conversation, just like we were. And I think that that will put a stop to it. And so, anyway, that... For whatever reason, me, that was the state, the strong me, that I needed to hear and eat. Thank you so much. Praise God, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you for your candid remarks <laughs> and your honesty. I know the Lord appreciates that. We do too. So, who'd like to go next? When Nancy was talking about the race there in Hebrews 12, you know, King Solomon talked about the, the race uh, <clears throat> in Ecclesiastes 9 and 11. He says, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happens to them all. And the Apostle Paul, speaking of, of the race, he says in 1 Corinthians 9, in verse 24, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And 
writing to the church there in Corinth, the church in Corinth, Corinth was actually the site of the Isthmian Games, which were run every two years. Uh, at that time, they were only second in fame to the Olympic Games. So Paul's stay in Corinth during his second missionary journey, which is uh, Acts 18, may very well have overlapped with those games, which are second only to the Olympic Games in 49 or 51 AD. So I thought that was interesting about the race yeah. that Paul would take uh, events that were happening in his environment at the time to explain to the people there in Corinth about the race that we're on. And, you know, Jesus, the Great Commission, uh, he tells us to go and teach all nations, which the word teach there is to make disciples of. So it's not mere converts, not just getting people saved, but making people disciples or disciplined ones not of ourselves, not disciples of ourselves, but disciples of Jesus. And when we do that, you're going to have people that, that are going to be having growth spurts in their Christian walk. They're going to, you know, have have these different times in their lives where they're going to grow very, very fast. And it's, uh, I know in my Eighth grade year, in the in the natural now, I was I, I think I was maybe five foot seven. Well, when I uh, went to high school that fall, I had grown from five foot seven to six foot one in, <laughs> over the summer. And I'm telling you, the kids that were in the in my class with me at the old grade school in the eighth grade. They, uh, most of them didn't recognize me because I had grown that much. And so uh, we, I, I know I myself, the worst thing a person can say to me is, you haven't changed a bit. Because, <laughs> you know, I still want to, even at my age, I want to still embrace change as the Lord brings change uh, into my radar screen, you know, that I know he's wanting to change an area of my life, and that's, uh, uh, like they used to say, you never get too old for milk, and never outgrow your need for milk, you know, uh, we never outgrow our need for growth either, and we need to continue to grow as long as we're here drawing breath on this earth, we need to continue to grow, so who would like to go next? I can go next. Yeah, go ahead. Alrighty, I got my notes up here. Just trying to get my screen in order. That was interesting about uh, the games. That was neat. Okay, so looking through the spiritual uh, growth chart that Ferris had, I just kind of picked a couple of uh, verses that were on there, and I just thought about what they meant to me, and I wrote that about that. So let's start in 1 Corinthians 2, 5. And I love to use the uh, Bible Gateway Online because it really does make it easier to find what you're looking for. Um, uh, it says, In this way you do not have faith in Christ because of the wisdom of men. You have faith in Christ because of the power of God. So when I think of wisdom of men, I think of everything wise that my parents have taught me, everything wise that my friends and family and teachers have taught me, and everything wise that the church has taught me that I think to myself, okay, there's a difference between wisdom and foolishness. And foolishness, 
you know, being, uh, when I think of wisdom, as far as our interactions with each other, I think of if you're loving to someone, then that is wise. Or if you are mean and you blow up at someone, that is foolish. Just, just to give a simple example of that. So with our interactions with each other, just that base practice of love is so important. And especially when we're talking to people who don't necessarily believe what we believe, we have to be, you know, on our best behavior because we want to have uh, the power of God and the wisdom of men. I think that would be so nice if we could have that. And I pray that the Lord give that to all of us. Um, you know, then that faith of Christ, faith in Christ being that he died for our sins and that, you know, his death is the, uh, the thing that affects our eternity, not ours. So, uh, you know, just that at the moment of our death, it won't matter what happens as long as we've lived a life of... Uh, wanting to please the Lord and be wise and not be foolish and be loving like he is loving with people, you know, even if we get it wrong and we have days where we're just having a bad day or we're having a terrible attitude and someone even has to correct us in love, if we just, you know, apologize and we get it right and, you know, how Jesus said, go and sin no more because, we're, you know, nobody is perfect. We're all going to have times where we blow up at each other or we're... You know, and, and I always look at that like that. Okay, that was really foolish of me. That was impulsive. I shouldn't have done that. I obviously made this person mad. You know, an apology is the way to go in that situation. So that's, that's what I thought of when I was just reading that one verse. Let's go on to the next one. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 2. Let me get the New King James Version back up here. I like that one myself. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you are not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal, for there are envy, strife, and divisions among you. You are not carnal and behaving like mere men. For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Paulus, are you not carnal? So, you know, just that, you know, we're all carnal sometimes, and we all get it wrong. And that is, I think, when you're talking about those times where you're, uh, you're, you have strife and divisions and you don't get along, that is more immature. But we all struggle with that. And it's, it's nothing to necessarily be ashamed of or uh, beat yourself up for. It's just, well, I learned that lesson, didn't I? Um, so let's go to Ephesians 1, 15. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And the next one I was thinking of was Ephesians 4, 11 to 15. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, 
that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried away with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. I loved that uh, one time Stu told me when you're an evangelist and you are a singer, that is evangelizing. And I never thought of that before. So that was really exciting for me to be called an evangelist because I always looked at the, you know, more famous evangelists like Billy Graham, uh, Billy Graham, excuse me. And, you know, I just think to myself, well, I can't talk good like him. I mean, there's just no way if I was up in front of, you know, thousands of people, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't be able to speak at all. I'd be so nervous, but, um, you know, with music, it's different. It's just, it's just so wonderful that, that God, uh, created the mind and even the things we can't remember he tells us in that moment and it really is the power of God and it's so cool to be able to see the Lord work uh, when I know okay I was definitely weak in this area but I just saw God go through me that's the power of Christ so that's always really neat the next one is Revelation three sixteen. And these are all these were all on the um, the sheet that we were given for tonight. It says, uh, "So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spew thee out of my mouth." So, um, the reason that when when I thought about this, I was thinking of this. A uh, 60 second YouTube clip that I saw, you know, sometimes you're on Facebook and you're just scrolling because you're bored or whatever. Well, I saw this 60 second clip of this Dr. Phil episode where this military father was crying his eyes out because his son had uh, come on camera wearing a woman's outfit and having makeup on and a wig and he was just crying. And, you know, Dr. Phil says to him, what are you feeling right now? He says, I'm really, really hurt. And that was the end of the clip. So, um, you know, I commented, um, in the comments I put, it's very sad, but I have faith that they are, de that your son is definitely cold. So God can still save them before they die. Um, you know, because this father was so hot, he was overcome with emotion and he couldn't help but cry in front of, you know, everybody. Um, so that was definitely hot on the father's part. And he did the right thing because the word tells us that there is a distinct difference between man and woman. And there's nothing wrong with saying that truth. As long as we're not being mean how we say that truth to people. Um, you know, I know that there are. There are some uh, churches that accept transgenderism, but I know ours doesn't, so I'm very thankful for that. Um, and, uh, you know, just seeing things in the news, and I think, okay, that is definitely lukewarm, in my opinion. And, um, you know, we don't want to be lukewarm because the Lord's going to spew us out of his mouth. So we definitely want to be hot. We definitely don't want to be in that space that says, oh, we need to just, um, you know, not say that this is wrong. No, we're allowed to have our opinion. We're allowed to be respectful how we have our opinion. Like I know one time I was talking with people online and they said, well, you're not, you know, they didn't know me. So they said, well, you're not violent, are you? You would never be violent towards someone like that. And I said, of course not. You know, my Jesus is is very loving and patient and kind, and he would never hurt anyone. And I know there are some evil people in this world who would lash out and even want to beat up somebody who's uh, transgender, which that's definitely wrong, too, because Jesus is not about violence. He hated violence. Um uh, anyway, 
Jesus was telling us in Matthew 17, uh, let's go there real quick. Matthew 17, 14 through 20. Oh, wait a minute, that's not the one. Um, in Proverbs 3, 3 through 6, it says, Let not mercy and truth forsake thee, bind them about thy neck, write them upon the table of thine heart, so shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. So if our understanding would be, you know, one of those, uh, in thinking of the foolish interaction and the wise interaction, if there would be people who we know that are transgender at work, you know, obviously there's a time and a place for everything, and we can't discuss our religious beliefs when we're on the clock at work, that would be foolish uh, if we, you know, don't want to lose our job, that is, and we want to keep our job. Um, but we can, you know, my dad's told me several times, we can always say, hey, I'd love to talk to you about my faith after work is over. And um, specifically, that mercy and truth, I feel like you know what Nancy was saying, how you don't want to be so mean that you're hurting people's feelings or laughing at them or, uh, you know, making fun of them because it certainly is a serious thing uh, when a person struggles with mental health. Um, you know, and depression and anxiety is such a real thing in our society that, you know, they have these hotlines you can call if you're feeling suicidal. I think the number's like 988 if you're having depression and that there are people that will uh, will take your condition extremely seriously uh, as they should and as we all should. And uh, when, when I see people that are transgender, I think to myself, they are at risk for suicide they are at risk for anxiety. So it's definitely a situation you want to be led of the Lord in, uh, especially in today, today's day and age, because I see people like that as the most immature. And, and when we're talking about babes and foolishness, I see that as being the most immature, foolish thing that you can do. Because even at daycare, you know, working in daycare, I've, I've let three-year-old boys dress up in princess dresses, and of course it seems really silly, but you're thinking, well, they're just kids, it doesn't matter. Well, you know, I've, I've heard of fathers before saying, don't you let my son dress up in a dress. He's, he's only three years old. He doesn't understand that yet, but still, this is my preference. I don't like that. So I, I definitely see a difference between hot and cold and then lukewarm, and I, that's the first thing I think of when I think of lukewarm in this generation, but at the same time, um, like what we were saying before, don't bite and devour one another, don't gossip about these people, uh, don't laugh at them, you know, or be mean, that's not merciful, and, you know, Proverbs says we have to uh, let not mercy and truth for safety bind them about thy neck. When I think of a binding, I think of a tight knot. So whenever I've, I've thought of Proverbs 3, that's what I've thought of. Um, then write them upon the table of thine heart. When I think of, okay, if, if I was having such, um, such feelings, I wouldn't want anybody to tell me I was wrong, and I wouldn't want anybody to make me feel bad for doing it either. I would want them to pretend with me to make me feel better. Well, that's not truth, okay? If we have truth bound to our neck in a knot, we can't forsake truth either. I mean, it's both. It goes hand in hand. But that mercy is having the truth, but I'm not going to hurt you. That's the mercy, is that you're not going to hurt anyone. 
that would um, be a babe or be foolish like that. And, um, you know, I think people get so offended when you tell them what your religious beliefs are. But at the same time, you, you know, you have to look at the mercy. You know, I could be a lot worse than what I am. And there have been Christians who've been a lot meaner than that. So, you know, maybe, you know, these people need to to appreciate the fact that um, there is both truth and mercy. And, uh, you know, Jesus tells us we will know someone by their fruit, whether they're good, a good tree or a bad tree. And, uh, you know, a, a, a evil tree cannot produce, produce good fruit, Jesus says, and, then, and a good tree cannot produce evil fruit. Well, I definitely think he was talking about violence and meanness. And when you see someone, you know, I've never seen someone get in a physical altercation in front of me before that was, uh, you know, that I would consider traumatic or violent, but I'm sure other people have. And I mean, it's, I'm sure it's very jarring. It's very shocking. And I know, um, just thinking of, uh, some of the World War II movies I've seen over the years because of my dad, he loves World War II movies, you know, just all these terms they have for uh, traumatic events like, like PTSD and all that, I think, you know, yeah, it's definitely, we are not supposed to be violent as individuals because it does not feel good. And even when children are violent with each other, you know, they instantly get in trouble at school and you're not supposed to be violent. But one thing I see with my generation is they are wanting you to have all mercy and no truth. And that's, you can't do that as a Christian. If you have bound mercy and truth on your neck, you can't forget about either one. And so I feel like it's good for other people to, to think about that. If we are talking to them, you know, if they're asking for our opinion, we don't want to be um, forceful about our opinion. And, you know, I just wanted to end with uh, John three sixteen. You know, Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I know I gave that prophecy on Sunday, and um, I was looking up what it means in the... The Greek word for condemn is krino, and it means to separate, put asunder, to pick out, select, or choose, to approve, esteem, or prefer, to be of opinion, deem, think, or be of opinion, to determine, resolve, decree, to judge, to pronounce an opinion concerning right and wrong, to be judged, summoned to trial, that one's case may be examined and judgment passed upon it. So, like, if you want to be, if you want someone else to be judged, you take them to trial. We think about that. Um, of those who act the part of judges or arbiters in matters of common life or pass judgment on the deeds and words of others to rule, govern, to preside over with the power of giving judicial decisions because it was the prerogative of kings and rulers to pass judgment to contend together of warriors and combatants, to dispute in a forensic sense. So when you think of forensic, you think someone has died. Oh dear. To go to law, have a suit at law. So Jesus says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. So when I think of the word condemn, the things that stand out to me, most of the definitions are that forensic and, you know, to contend together warriors and combatants and the rule of law. So um, there's nothing wrong with us thinking to ourselves, is this a right thing or is this a wrong thing? Because our entire society does it. And the minority of people who are transgendered, who don't have any rule of law whatsoever, I personally believe that they have not tied truth around their neck. And, um, it's a very sad thing. It's a very scary thing because when I feel like whenever you would talk to someone about that, if there would be a friend, 
the first thing in my mind I would think is you probably can't understand or receive anything I'm saying because you're a baby and this is too much truth. So you would be telling them meat. You would be, it's, it would be like giving a baby meat as opposed to giving a baby milk. And if someone is depressed or anxious or suicidal in a very serious way, like many minority groups are, um, you know, we have to start them off with the milk of God's word, which I personally feel is, you know, just God loves you as you are and he wants to save you and he doesn't want you to perish. And, you know, the word says, uh, God's not willing that any man should perish that all come to repentance. So um, I love that about Jesus, that no matter what stage we're in, he's always going to save us when we call on his name. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Praise God. Thank you, Deborah. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I believe one of the aspects of speaking the truth in love is not expecting the person that you're speaking the truth to to change immediately. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Because, you know, the truth must not be used as a club to bludgeon people into acceptance and obedience, but must always be presented in love, which is, involves time. Years ago, a uh, person that happened to be a homosexual called Ferris on the phone and he said, what would you think about, there's a group of us that would like to come and visit your church service. And Ferris said, come on. And so, the, you know, they were welcome to come in. They weren't welcome to disrupt the meeting. But the thing was, they just wanted to see if they could. And Ferris said, yes, come on. You know, because, because God, like, so loved the world, he loves the people in the world. He doesn't love the world system. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But then the condition of salvation, whosoever should believe on him should not perish. So people sometimes, they just want to see, they want to stick their toe in the water and they want to see. Of course they're not welcome to come and cause a big fuss and disruption because God is a God of order, not of confusion. But he welcomed and said, yeah, come on. And so we have to realize that, that the truth leads the Christian to maturity. Like the scripture that you, that you read there in Ephesians 4 15, speaking the truth in love that, that truth, it leads the Christian to maturity and, and to grow up in Christ. And that's part of the growth cycle that we're talking about here tonight. That speaking the truth in love, causing growth to come up to the full stature of the measure of Christ. So, Amen. It's, uh, it's 9 o'clock, so... Uh, maybe some of the others had things to say. You know, if you want to get up on Sunday, I know Clay is going to present the uh, annual report, I think, on Sunday, aren't you, Clay? So we'll do that. And if you have something that you wanted to share, you didn't get to share tonight, why don't we do it uh, during the testimonies and, and time there um, you know, it says, how is it then, brethren, 1 Corinthians 14, 26, how is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you, as a psalm, as a doctrine, as a tongue, as a revelation, as an interpretation, let all things be done to define. So there's revelations that people might have. There's exhortations. I know I was having lunch with Mike Maxwell the other day, and I, uh, he began... He used to want to be a preacher, and I said, well, anytime God gives you a word, you just let whoever is in charge. I said, you know, know that you've got a word, and I said, nine times out of ten, they'll have time for you to sh share your exhortation, your encouragement, yeah. or a revelation, something that God shows you out of the word. You know? 